So our opening question here was a review question. We've got chlorine isotope with a mass of 37. How many neutrons does it have? Well, remember mass number is protons plus neutrons. The fact that it is chlorine will tell us, okay, well that CL, I'll put number 17. So it has 17 protons. So 17 protons plus the number of neutrons has to equal 37. 37 minus 17 would be 20 neutrons. So we were looking for an answer of 20 there. Right, let's take a look at another review question. How many electrons belong to a neutral atom with an atomic mass of 39? I'm going to give you a minute to think about this one. I don't want you to overthink it. Okay, let's see what he said. All right, most of us are wrong. So the correct answer here is B. We can't determine. Now, why can't we determine the correct answer here? Well, again, let's go back to the wording of the question. The question said we have an atom with a mass of 39. It's neutral. How many electrons are there? Now, from that mass of 39, what do I know about the, the atom itself? I know that the nucleus has 39 particles in it. That doesn't tell me anything about how many of them are protons and how many of them are neutrons. And we know that isotopes exist. So it's very possible that, although 19 is probably the answer we've come up with first, in terms of, well, if there are 39 particles, mass that is closest to 39 is potassium. Potassium has 19 protons, so 19 protons and 19 electrons. But even that doesn't really kind of fit logically because we know that there are other versions of potassium. There are other ways we can get argon to have a, a mass of 39. Just knowing the mass number is not enough to know the makeup of the nucleus itself. I need that atomic number. That atomic number tells me how many of those particles are protons. And since protons give us the identity, I need to know that number. So without that information, I really can't figure out much of anything as is related to the atom itself. So a little bit of a trick question there, but nonetheless, that was what we were kind of going after was trying to get a handle on knowing what we can get from certain pieces of information and what we definitely cannot get from certain kinds of information about the atom. Now, if that scares you that not many of you got it right, know that you're in good hands. Because 
the morning section also had about the same kind of response rate that you did. So, let's move on then into a little bit of talk about how to actually calculate these masses. So, Wednesday, we talked a little bit about how this is made up. The idea that a mass number gives us the particles in the nucleus, but that really doesn't match up with what the information on the periodic table is. Periodic table information is average atomic mass, where we take all of the different isotopes of a given element and we compare them and kind of weigh them against how much that particular isotope is in terms of how common it is. The more common it is, the more of an impact it's going to have on the average mass. So based off of this information here, we know that there are three common isotopes of neon. The most common of those common isotopes is neon 20. So if I look at the periodic table, I would expect that the mass of neon 20 is probably pretty close to that 19.99 AMUs. If I look, I can see neon has a molar mass or, or an atomic mass of 20.18. So again, really, really close. Why is it not exactly this value of 19.9924? Well, because we've got these other isotopes in the mix there that because of their abundance, they are going to drag that average atomic mass up a little bit because they are a little bit heavier. Now, how do we go about that calculation? Well, the calculation itself is relatively simple. I take the mass and I multiply it by the abundance. And then I add those values together. So, this mass of neon 20, 19.9924, multiplied by the abundance, 90.4838%. Now, sig figs do play into this as well. I've got six digits in this number and six digits in this number. So my product, is going to have six digits in it as well. So my calculator gives me about as many digits as is possible for this model of calculator. I've got to round it to six digits. So when I do that, it's 1,808.99. Now I'm going to do the same thing for the other values. 20.9940 times 0.2696. This time I'm only going to round to four digits because even though know, this mass still has six digits, my percentage only has four digits. Where the zero in the front doesn't count as a significant digit. So I have four digits in here and six. I've got to round the four digits there. And that's going to give me 5.660. Um, six, six, and then lastly, 21.9914. Multiply by 9.2465. This time I'm going to round to five digits because my abundance here only has five digits instead of six. So 203.34. 
My next step, now I've got all of the multiplication done, I need to add these together. So 1,808.99 plus 5.660 plus 203.34. Is 2017.990. Now, here's where we can get a little bit confused. We're doing adding this time. So, significant figures aren't based upon the number of digits, but rather on where those digits are. So, let's flip over to the highlighter here. In my first value, it's the second decimal place. That was the last significant digit. So I'm going to highlight the second decimal place here. In my second number, it was the third decimal place. That was the last significant. So I'm going to highlight that there. And here in the last number, it was also the second place. So I'm going to highlight that there again. When I'm adding and subtracting, if all of the decimal places are all in the same spot, I don't have to do anything further. I'm already good. If I have a situation like this, where I've got multiple decimal places, multiple spots, where I have estimated digits, I have to round for the leftmost estimated digit. Now, in this case, it really doesn't matter. The other digit was zero. So, magnitude standpoint, nothing's really changing. But from an interpretation standpoint, our final value here has two decimal places, six total digits. Now, the other question you might be asking yourself is, so hold on, wait a second. 2017. That doesn't match any of the masses over there. It's not even close. Well, there's one more thing that we have to do. We use percentages here. Percentages are multiplied by 100. So the value that I get off of this is 100 times bigger than what it should be. To turn this into an actual mass, I need to get rid of that 100x factor. So I'm going to divide by 100. And when I do so, it's going to give me my final value, 20.1799 AMU. And if I look at the periodic table, 20.1799 is pretty darn close to the value that is listed for neon on the periodic table. The differences between the two are probably rounding issues or rounding issues in terms of the values we have for the percent abundance fields or for the mass. Otherwise, pretty well the same. All right, any questions about this from a technique standpoint? How to actually crunch the numbers and do this? Right, because I'm about to turn it over to you and ask you to answer a question. So we have copper. Copper exists as both copper 63 and copper 65. Copper 63 makes up just over 69% of copper. Copper 65 makes up the rest of copper. We need to figure out what the average atomic mass is. So follow that exact same series of steps, piece by piece, and try to get the average atomic mass. you will let you go at it on your own here for a couple of minutes, and then we'll walk through how to do it and get the correct answer here at the end.
right, it looks like we're mostly there, although not everybody's put their answer in yet. So um, I'm going to start walking you through it. And if you come across the answer as we're going through, just go ahead and send it in um, as we're talking. So the key here, we had to do the exact same process over again. So taking the atomic mass and multiplying it by its abundance, when we did so for the first isotope, 4,353 would have been the answer. Again, we've got to limit ourselves to the number of significant figures, in this case, based on the percentage. So I needed to round that first value to just four digits. So that's why it rounds this way. Same thing for the second day. Now, how did I get to 3,833? Well, if the first isotope is 59.17% and this other isotope is the rest of it, the rest has to add up to 100%. So 100% minus what we already know would give me the 30.83% that I'm looking for. So I take that mass times that percentage, I get 2002 when I round the second one. And so if you came up with 63.54 instead of 63.55, this is probably where you make that rounding error, putting that 2001.7 into 2001 instead of rounding it up to 2002. That being said, everything else here kind of checks out. Um, you add the two numbers together, in this case, both numbers are known to the exact same decimal place. They're both known to the ones place. So the last digit in both cases was that digit. So I need to do no further rounding from there. I just need to divide by 100 to get rid of the percentages. And I get 63.55 and use the unit. All right, any questions? Uh, before we move on and move forward here. Okay, Charles. What was that? So when we multiply, it's always the value that has the fewest digits. So in this particular set of examples, the percentages always had the fewest number of digits. It may not always be that way, that's why we need to track how many digits are in each number. And whenever we multiply or divide, it's the number of digits that we track and round to at the end. Yeah, so if we only knew the values to three digits, we would round all of those to three. So it's always dependent on your worst the least precise measure. Yeah, it's called the weakest link rule. Anytime we do any kind of rounding, we always round to the weakest link. The weakest link is our least precise measure. So whether it's the least precise because it has the fewest number of digits, or it's the least precise because it has the fewest decimal places, that's a uh, discussion for what kind of function we're doing. Are we multiplying or are we adding? All right, other questions? Okay, so I'm going to ask you to break out your periodic tables here now. And what we want to do is we're going to walk through the periodic table here. Um, and what I want you to know, I'm going to give you all the information here on each slide, but I'm not going to give it to you as I go through the slides. I'm going to give it to you as I'm talking you through where to find this information on the periodic table itself. So if you're looking for those kind of comprehensive lists, don't worry about trying to jot down every single thing I'm saying. Everything I'm saying is, is here in these slides. And you can download the slides off of Top Hat or Blackboard. What I want to focus us on, though, is to uh, 
the same periodic table that you're using. So the periodic table is organized in a number of different factors and characteristics. So first of all, it's called a periodic table because the periods, the rows of the table are structured in this kind of way. And so the reason it's periodic is because within a given row, if I start looking at things from column to column to column, what I will find is that regardless of period, elements in the same column have similar kinds of properties, both in terms of physical kind of characteristics, as well as chemical characteristics, the way that they react and interact with the rest of the world. We can split the periodic table into two areas, the metals and the non-metals. And the dividing line between metal and non-metal is this thicker black line that kind of staircases through the right side of the table. On one side of this line, we have all of the metals. On the other side of this line, we have the nonmetals. Now, the differences in characteristic between metal and nonmetal are very wide and broad. So, we know metal. Metals are um, flexible. We can easily bend them, shape them into whatever we want them to do, pound them into thin sheets, draw them into long wires. Metals tend to be very shiny. They tend to be solid. They tend to have really high melting points, high boiling points uh, because of their solid nature. Really, the only thing that's kind of dull about metals, and not literally, is just they're not very varied in their colors. Metals are kind of silvery, silver white, gray, or gold. Yeah. Copper orange, I guess, is a, another color. There's not a whole lot of variability in Nonmetals, on the other hand, tend to be kind of the opposite. Instead of being super flexible and bendy and being able to, you know, smack it into sheets and draw it into wires, nonmetals are really brittle. You hit a nonmetal with a hammer, it doesn't just bend or, or crater, it smashes. They're not very shiny, um, non-metals are. They're usually dull in appearance or really don't have much of an appearance at all. We have a wide variety of colors. So from a color and space standpoint, non-metals are known to be in the solid phase. We have a non-metallic, non-metal uh, liquid bromine that is orange. We have gases. We have solids, wider variety of phases for non-metals. They all tend to have similar properties, though, in terms of they don't melt at very high temperatures. They don't boil at very high temperatures. Very easy to get them to convert phases. But from a color and complexity standpoint, the sky's the limit. Iodine as a solid is purple. Bromine as a liquid is orange. Chlorine as a gas is kind of yellowish. Nitrogen and oxygen and most of the noble gases are colorless. Carbon is black. Phosphorus ranges anywhere from white to purple in color, depending upon its um, orientation and configuration. Sulfur is bright yellow. Lots of different ways of looking as far as nonmetals go. Conductivity-wise, metals conduct electricity and heat, non-metals don't. In between, we have the metalloids. The metalloids we can find actually on that dark staggered staircase. And metalloids kind of fit the best of both worlds or at least fit into both worlds. Take silicon, for example. 
silicon is kind of non-metallic in the way that it acts. Not terribly reactive, doesn't really make ions like most metals do, but it kind of conducts electricity. And if we really purify it and get it down to the right temperature, it really conducts electricity quite well. But uh, kind of shiny. It really doesn't fit in either way. It's got the conductivity and the shininess of a metal, but the brittleness and lack of reactivity of a non-metal. I think they both stop. And so metal alloys, semi-metals, they fit into this entire area here. Now let's take a look at some of the different zones of the periodic table. Some of the common families, if you will. So group one, this is a group known as the alkali metals. Now the alkali metals have a number of things in common. First of all, most metals tend to form positive ions. They tend to lose electrons when they make compounds. When alkali metals lose electrons, they tend to lose only one electron and make a positive one ion. Now, the kinds of reactivity that we see out of alkali metals, they are highly reactive. Highly, highly reactive react violently with water, react instantly with air. They tend not to exist for very long in their elemental states. They want to react and form compounds. On the flip side, row, or excuse me, column 18 here, family 18, these are the noble gases. And one of the defining features of the noble gases is that they don't have charges. Why don't they have charges? Well, they don't react. They don't react at all. And since the formation of ions is a product of reactivity, they don't make ions. They just don't. Now, more closely related as far as non-metals are concerned to the alkali metals are what we call the halogens. The halogens exist in group 17 here, and they are kind of the non-metallic equivalent of the alkali metals. Highly reactive non-metals, they form a negative one charge, as opposed to a positive one charge. And that's a non-metallic characteristic. Non-metals tend to form negative charges. So metals tend to be positive, non-metals tend to be negative. Halogens tend to be negative one. Coming back over here to the metal side, group two is a group of metals that have very similar properties to the alkali metals. The alkaline earth metals are reactive with air and are reactive with water. But they're reactive in both senses to a considerably lesser extent. So whereas the alkali metals react with water and it's almost explosive in its violence in terms of its reactivity. I take that same alkaline earth metal, put it into water, and it fizzes. One darn near explodes, the other one just bubbles. Massive difference in terms of reactivity. Slight difference in terms of charge positive two there as opposed to positive one. The non-metal equivalent to that would be something called the chalcogens.
group 16, the oxygen group, and they form a negative two charge. In here, we have some really reactive non-metal. So oxygen is a very reactive part of our atmosphere. Sulfur can be found in a lot of different um, rocks. But the reactivity is not nearly as violent as the, that of the halogens. Now, those are the only five groups that have specific names. Other groups get kind of lumped in generically. So these metals in the middle are referred to as transition metals. And there aren't a ton of really common traits to any of them, other than they are kind of, sort of, not really all that reactive. And they form positive ions, but those charges are not consistent. Even less reactive are these here called the inner transition metals, the ones down here in the bottom. They're even less so. All right, one last thing that we're going to add. You can see that we're starting to kind of build a pattern here as far as charges are concerned. Plus one on one extreme, negative one on the other extreme. Come in a little bit, it's positive two and negative two. Well, if we continue to come in the boron group, tends to form positive three ions. And the nitrogen group tends to form negative three ions, at least for the non-metals in that group. We get down here to bismuth. Bismuth we treat like a transition metal, kind of goes in multiple directions. The carbon group, we're just gonna leave that one alone. Main reason we're gonna leave it alone, these are reactive but they tend not to react ionically. They tend to react covalently and share electrons. So that takes us through our brief walk through the periodic table. On your way out, make sure that you answer this last question. So, it kind of sort of goes that way, but not really. So, carbon very rarely forms ionic compounds. Silicon forms virtually no ionic compounds. The only place where we see the positive four really is in the tin and the lead. The tin and lead are transition metals. In addition to being positive four, we also know them as positive two. We'll get more into that in, in module three. I know I kept you here. Thanks for sticking around. I'll see you next week.